Hi folks, welcome back. This is part two of our lecture series on analyzing articles using sociology to understand the world. At this point, you should have already listened to the first part of this lecture series and also analyzed the first article. And if you haven't done that yet, then you do need to go back to that first lecture and cover that material before you move on here. Now in this lecture series, there's a lot of information that we're going to cover. In the first part, we did cover population frames, generalizability, how to identify the research question, reliability, and validity. And along with that, we also covered some additional concepts, the margin of error, operationalizing, and conceptualizing. In this particular lecture, we're going to cover ethics and the peer review process. So let's get a start. All right, the first thing you need to do is read the article, Facebook's Research Problem. And again, I don't want you to worry about analyzing the article yet. At this point, just read it for comprehension. So pause the recording now, read the article, and then come back when you're done. All right, so do you think there was a little bit of an ethical issue there? So let's do a little bit of background work first. Let's talk about what ethics are. Defined, ethics are a system of principles that help us decide what is morally right or wrong. And we develop our morals, which are socially acceptable standards, by talking to other people uh, through our institutions, such as education and religion. We develop our morals through the workplace, our peers, our parents, all of these places play a role in how we decide what our moral compass will be. And we begin to internalize these things that we think might be right or wrong. And that is how we create a system of ethics which guides our society to decide what is morally right or wrong. So we have an individual script of morals that we go by as individuals. And as we talk to other people, and as we are influenced by other people, we create a code of ethics that governs the behavior of our society and which helps us to define what we consider to be right or wrong behavior as a society. This helps us to develop laws and it helps us to guide our behavior when we come in contact with other people in the workplace, in the classroom, in a movie theater, all of these places that we go where we come into contact with other people. That's what ethics are. Now in the field of sociology in the United States, we have the American Sociological Association, or the ASA. And the ASA is the governing body that has decided our code of ethics, the code of ethics that sociologists in the United States have agreed are important and that guide the research that we do with human subjects. This is a common set of values that we've agreed upon which help to guide how we behave when we do our research. So these rules aren't enforceable by a governing board necessarily, but as American sociologists, we've essentially agreed that these five principles are things that we will not violate when we do our research. So the first principle, recognize your limitations and ensure your competence. And how do you do that? Well, one of the things that sociologists are pretty good at, as I'm sure most academics are, is discussing what they want to do as far as research is concerned with their colleagues. And this helps us to be able to iron out all of the problems that we might have from an ethical perspective as we work with human subjects. Another piece of that is also ensuring that we are competent enough to do the work, recognizing our limitations, and then also continuing our education. So even if, for example, as I do, even if we have a PhD in the field of sociology, that doesn't mean we know everything there are always new techniques being developed in the research field. And it's our job as researchers to make sure that we understand those boundaries and continue to educate ourselves 
on those new breakthroughs so that when we do decide to do research, that competence level is there. The second piece, be honest and fair. Have integrity about your work, not only protecting the research subject, but also being honest and respectful in our professional activities, doing what we do to inspire trust and confidence in others. The third piece, using the highest scientific standards. So we have to gain the trust of the public in order to do our work. And the best way for us to do that is to be transparent about the processes that we use. And so if we use science, the scientific process to do our research, we are ensuring that we are doing that research in the best possible way. The fourth piece, respect the rights and dignity of others. Respect the diversity of people. Uh, here we want to make sure that we make the best possible attempt to eliminate bias in our professional activities, to make sure that we don't tolerate discrimination in any way, shape, or form, uh, to be sensitive to different cultural differences and individual differences as we conduct research. So really here it's about being fair to other people. And the last piece of the ASA Code of Ethics is using our knowledge for the good of others for society. Making sure that when we do research, that research or those findings are going to be beneficial to other people, to other groups, to society in general. It's really important for us to contribute to what we would call the public good, which means that the real essence of a public sociologist in the United States is to make sure that the research they are doing has some purpose to society. So that's a pretty good code of ethics and it does guide the research of social scientists in the United States. And a lot of us would agree that really the most important thing we have to keep in mind when we do research with human subjects is to protect those research participants. Because not every single person, not every single sociologist shares exactly the same morals or ethics, we use the ASA Code of Ethics to help guide our work. But we're always thinking at the forefront about making sure that what we're doing doesn't harm our human subjects. That's really the very first lesson that you learn as a researcher. This doesn't, however, mean that mistakes can't be made. There are a lot of experiments in our history. Here are a few of the more common ones that we already know about, which have really crossed the line with regard to ethical behavior. Now, the Tuskegee syphilis experiment is not from the field of sociology. However, it was a medical experiment that lasted for quite some time, for decades, and really crossed an ethical boundary with those research participants. The Milgram shock experiment and the Stanford prison experiment are both two that came from the field of social and behavioral science. And both of those, again, crossed the line. There are many other examples of how mistakes can be made in social science research and those ethical boundaries can be crossed. And because of these mistakes, we really do want to go back to protecting the research participant as the very first ethical lesson in the field of social science research. So how do we make sure that our research participants are protected? Well, there are a lot of things we can do. Of course, we want to talk with other sociologists to see if what we have in mind for research sounds reasonable, and you iron out those questions and problems you might have before you even move forward at that point. You also use the ASA Code of Ethics to guide your behavior. You also want to make sure that you have the right credentials and education to do the research that you want to do. 
Some more specific and pointed ways to protect your research participants is by using an institutional review board. So what exactly is an institutional review board or an IRB? IRBs exist in all venues where research is conducted by sociologists, by psychologists, by psychiatrists, by medical doctors. Anytime you work with research with human subjects, you will find an IRB. An IRB is made up of a panel of experts who have done research with human subjects and who will look at a research proposal and will decide whether or not you are following the right code of ethics. And so let me give you an example of how an IRB works. If you work for a government agency that does research with human subjects, if you are working on um, a master's degree where you have to do a thesis or a dissertation where you have to do work with human subjects at the PhD level, you will find an institutional review board either at that agency that you work for or at that school that you are attending, that college or university. You have to put forth a proposal before you can ever even embark on doing that research. And that proposal has to outline exactly what you plan to do, how you plan to do it, what your population under study will be, how you're going to approach getting information from them. And that institutional review board, which is made up of volunteer employees at that agency or professors at that college or university, will read that proposal and they will decide whether or not you can continue to develop that research project. If they have any questions at all, they are going to come back to you and they are going to ask you for clarification. And if they feel that a research participant may be harmed in any way, whether that's physically, mentally, psychologically, emotionally, they will put a stop to that project moving forward. So pretty much any agency today where there is research with human subjects will have some kind of IRB in place to make sure that no ethical line is crossed. Once you get that research approval from the IRB, you also then have to obtain what we call informed consent. Informed consent is letting the research participant or research subject know what they're getting themselves into. Now, that's a difficult thing to do when you're working with human subjects because you don't want to give them enough information that might change their behavior or the outcome or the results of your research. So here is a fine line. You have to give them enough information so that they know what they're getting themselves into in a general kind of way. You also have to make sure they understand that they are allowed to opt out with no penalty at any time. So at any point that they want to say, I quit, you must let them quit. So this is what informed consent is, and this is a form that you will go over with each research participant so that you can make sure they understand. This is what the research is about in general. This is how I propose to get that information, and you may stop at any point without penalty. And then finally, once you've gone through all of these things, you're going to also go through what we call a peer review process. And this happens after you've finalized your research. So you've completed your research project, and now you want to share your results with your peers and with the public. And you can't do that unless you go through the peer review process. So in an academic field, when we publish our research, we do so in a journal. And those journals are where academics share information about the research that they are doing. And in order to get your research published in one of those journals, you have to first 
send it out to your peers for review. So there's a formal process that you go through. Uh, you write up your research, you send it to the editor of a specific journal that you might have in mind, and that editor will send that unpublished manuscript out to a handful of your peers. And those peers who are usually specialists in that specific field of research that you've done, go through your unpublished manuscript and they find areas of weakness, they ask questions that you may have forgotten to address, and they essentially help you to tighten up that unpublished manuscript so that when it is published, you can be sure that that information has gone through the most rigorous review of experts in that field. So all of these steps help us to protect the research participant and ensure that we don't cross over into a iffy ethical area. So what I'd like for you to do now is to go back to that article and see if you can pick out those areas which mention ethical or moral boundaries that might have been crossed. So here are the two things I want you to do. Answer the following two questions. Did Facebook violate research ethics? And if so, what evidence is presented in the article that helps you to substantiate your answer to the first question? So take a minute now and let's see what you can find. Okay, so what do we feel is the big problem here? It's kind of spelled out for us in the article that informed consent didn't really happen. Now, Facebook says that when you sign up for an account, you agree to their data use policy, which constituted informed consent for this research. But that's not the way that sociologists define informed consent. Informed consent happens at the onset of a particular research project, and the person who is participating, the research participant or the research subject, same thing, understands what they're getting into and understands the duration of the project and understands that they can opt out at any time. So Facebook did not do that. Facebook just said that when you signed up for your account and you had pages and pages of fine print that you had to agree to, it was in that information that you agreed to informed consent. So there are some serious ethical problems with this research. Not only uh, the informed consent issue, but also that this paper got published in a journal, the journal titled Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. And this research was affiliated with Cornell and the University of California, San Francisco. And these are problematic issues for us in the field of sociology because it really borders on unethical behavior. And so even with all of the back and forth in this article, we have to ask ourselves, did the researchers who agreed to work with Facebook uh, really consider whether or not they were harming their human subjects? And I think that we can probably say this was not a good idea. Now, it's an interesting thing to me when I'm talking about this article in the physical classroom in front of my students, I can see the discomfort on their faces because they don't have any way of knowing whether or not they participated in this research project. They very well could have, and that's a problem for us. Now, to give informed consent to these research participants, we wouldn't necessarily have to tell them that we were going to manipulate their news feed to try and influence how they post, but we would need to tell them that we were going to provide certain information via their news feed and that we were going to monitor their posting behavior for a certain period of time. And then we would also have to allow them the ability to opt out of the project at any time. The researchers who conducted this research didn't follow any of those steps. That's problematic for us. 
So you can see where research ethics are a very, very important component to the protection of human subjects. All right, now there's one more thing you can do to finish up this lesson, and that is take the Facebook article and see if you can figure out also what is the population frame? What is the research question? Whether or not we can generalize these findings and how reliable and valid the researchers and the findings are. As we move through this information, you should always go back and review the prior articles and lessons and see what you can fill in. This will be very, very helpful to you as you move towards your midterm and your final exam. And again, if you have any questions, issues, or need clarification, please make sure that you use your discussion board in this lesson. All right, until next time, take care. Bye-bye.